grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, dear fellow redeemed. Have you ever seen a movie or read a book where the main character is on the run? A lot of tension and suspense can be built up in a setting where someone is always on the run, especially if it's from something that's evil. Sometimes life itself can feel like we're constantly on the run. With every corner that we turn, sin lurks and holds some sort of temptation or test over us, some sort of evil before us. But is running the best option? Should life be a constant game of dipping and dodging and running here and there to try to avoid disaster? Instead of running, should we rather fight? This is exactly the image that God presents in our text for today. He does not want his people to be constantly on the run from sin and evil in this world. He wants to give them a solution. He wants to give them the ability to conquer that evil. <clears throat> the portion we read from Exodus comes from a time when the children of Israel had just departed from Egypt. As we well know, they were traveling east back towards their homeland of Canaan. But it didn't take long for them to be confronted with a problem. Soon they ran into the Red Sea. Now the Red Sea was not a simple river that they could wade across. You couldn't see from one shore to the other. It was so vast. So the Israel didn't have boats. They were nearly two million people strong without a hope, without a way to get across that sea. That was problem number one that the Israelites were faced with. As they examined their options, and as they contemplated how they would cross the Red Sea, problem number two came along. They looked back in the distance, back toward Egypt, and they saw Pharaoh with his army of horses and chariots coming to take them back into slavery. Talk about being caught between a rock and a hard place. On one side, they had an impassable body of water, on the other side, an army of enemies that wanted to conquer them. What hope did they have? What option did they have? They couldn't simply run away. The chariots would track them down eventually. They couldn't hide. They were two million people in the middle of the desert. Where were they going to go? But as Moses aptly puts it, the only solution that they had was simply to stand still and wait for God to deliver them. We have the benefit of looking back on this account and reading about it from beginning to end. And no doubt we've all heard this story many times before. We know it very well. And sometimes because of that, we lose track of how disastrous this really could have been. Think about for a moment what it was like to be one of those Israelites. Put yourself in their shoes. Imagine yourself with the Red Sea on one side and seeing the army approaching on the other. Would you be tempted to doubt God? Would you be tempted to make a run for it on your own and try to do it yourself? No doubt we all would. And no doubt the Israelites thought this way too as we hear their complaint to Moses. Is it because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us to bring us out, to, out of Egypt? Is not this what we said to you in Egypt? Leave us alone that we may serve the Egyptians. For would it, it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. How quickly the Israelites forsake their newfound freedom that they love so much. How quickly they turn away from God and doubt Him. But you and I aren't any better. You and I have done the same thing in our lives many times before. We've been faced with situations that are a lot less dangerous, and we've still doubted God. We've still complained to God. We've still told Him that He hasn't done enough for us. Perhaps there's been a month where you were late on your month's rent or your mortgage, and you didn't know where you'd find the money. Maybe you were confronted with some sort of health ailment that just wouldn't go away. Perhaps you have a pet sin that you just can't get rid of, even though you know it's wrong because it doesn't really hurt anybody, right? 
how quickly we come up with excuses for the evils that encounter us, how quickly we try to run from problem to problem without encountering it, without going up against it. It's much easier to run from our problems and to keep offering up excuses than to finally look for a solution that works. But how should a Christian confront his or her problems? Well, we have a lesson here in these short verses from Exodus. The Israelites had just been freed from bondage that had lasted hundreds of years. No doubt they were eager to get back to their homeland and be free again. So they started off on their journey quickly. And as they were going along, everything seemed to be going well, except they forgot one thing. They forgot who their leader really was. They forgot who had rescued them from Egypt, who had delivered them from Pharaoh, who was going to bring them home safely. As soon as they got their freedom, they looked to themselves immediately. They forgot about God. It wasn't Moses, nor was it Aaron that got the Israelites out of Egypt. It was God alone. In the same way, it's not ourselves, it's not those around us, it's not me that's going to help you with your problems in life, it's God alone. Too often we take the same attitude of the Israelites where we get our freedom, we get our deliverance from God, and we start off so quickly that we dump God on the side of the road because we don't need Him anymore. But let us remember through good times and bad who our leader is. It's God alone the one who gives us deliverance, the one who gives us rescue, just as he did for the Israelites. Instead of being caught up in the moment, instead of looking only to ourselves, let us stop, stand still, and wait on God's deliverance. Only God can offer deliverance to the biggest problems that we face. Those are the problems of sin, death, Satan's temptations, the wickedness of the world around us, those are things that we can't touch. Only God can help us with those things. Now, we readily admit that we can't do things to solve those problems. We readily admit that we must rely on God. But what we often forget is that even the small problems in life, even the physical things that we go through, are a result of those bigger problems. What we often forget is that if God can take care of those biggest problems in our lives, He can certainly take care of the small ones too. I don't need to rely on God only to deliver me from sin and death and Satan. I can rely on Him to help me with the smallest problems because when He has taken those big foes out of the way, the small problems are taken care of as well. What's left to pay for that Christ hasn't already paid for on the cross? What kind of problem can we encounter in life that forgiveness at the hands of God can't solve? God's destruction of the Egyptian army and his safe passage of the Israelites through the Red Sea were only two examples of this great deliverance that God gives. All of the blessings that God has given to our lives, these two blessings that we see in our text, are a result of forgiveness that Christ has won on the cross for us. If Christ hadn't paid for our sins, if he hadn't died in our place, it wouldn't matter what happened to us today. We wouldn't have any solution. We wouldn't have any deliverance from anything. While we still continue to struggle with sin and to fight against the evils that we see, the solution is not in doubt. Jesus has delivered us from every evil. God uses those daily hardships to bring us closer to him in his word. Like the attitude of the Israelites, he uses tough times to refine our relationship with him, to make it stronger and more secure. Even God can use the wicked things in life to work out for good. When speaking about the problems that we face in life, Jesus himself offered this simple advice. Come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Every problem, we, every problem we face, every hardship that we encounter, even if it is a, a direct result of sin, is an opportunity for us to grow closer to our Savior. 
Christ offers his back to carry our load. He offers his hands and his feet to be pierced in our place to carry and suffer the punishment that we deserve. The beauty of our church services each Sunday is that they offer us many opportunities to stand still and see the Lord's salvation. Earlier this morning, as we do each Sunday, we confessed our sins and we received the promise of forgiveness from God. What does this mean to you? Is it just something that you say each week because it's printed out in front of you? Is it just emotion that you go through again and again because your parents taught you that way and their parents taught them that way and on and on and on? Or does it mean something more? Is it something more important? When we confess our sins in faith, trusting in the words of God and the works of Jesus as our own, it is something special indeed. For in that confession, you are stopping, you are standing still, and you are saying, God, I cannot help myself. I need to look to you for deliverance. When you confess your sins and who you are, According to your sinful flesh, you are stopping, you are standing still, you are no longer running from the truth you have found. It. Through the message of forgiveness in the gospel, the Lord fights for you. And through that fight, you are able to see that the salvation for yourself. Another part of our service each Sunday is to read portions of God's word as we did again this morning. What does this mean to you? Is it time to relax and zone out for a moment so that you don't have to think about anything or don't have to focus on anything? Is it time to hunker down and get ready for me to spout off again from the pulpit? Open it. Perhaps it means something more to us. Perhaps it means something like what it meant to Mary. Remember that story? Remember what she was doing? Remember what Martha was doing? Martha was running about the kitchen, getting the meal ready, going from here to there without any time to listen to the Lord. Mary, on the other hand, took that opportunity to stop and sit at the feet of Jesus and hear his words. The time we take each Sunday is an opportunity to sit at the feet of our Savior and to hear him speak to us. It's an opportunity to have him tell us what he wants us to know. It's an opportunity for us to lay our burdens at his feet, to take him up on that promise of coming to him with all of our problems. Hearing the word of Christ is not just hearing empty words. It's an opportunity for us to see and realize God's salvation on our own. It's an opportunity to stop running and to listen to him. Finally, we come to the part of the service that we're about to partake in, the Lord's Supper. What does this mean to you? Is it just an outdated ritual that really doesn't have any significance or power? Is it just a myth and a symbol like the world says that it is? Is it just something that we do so that we don't feel left out? On the contrary, we know that the Lord's Supper is indeed something much greater. By the promise of our Lord, by the power of His Word, the Lord's Supper gives us the forgiveness of sins. We hear the very words of Jesus spoken to us, given and shed, shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. It's not a myth. It's not a symbol. It's seeing and realizing the Lord's power and deliverance for ourselves. It's stopping, standing still, and experiencing the Lord's salvation. Yes, indeed, each time we gather around the Lord's Word, whether it be in church, whether it be at our homes, whether it be by ourselves, it's an opportunity to stop running and to listen to our Lord. When we continue to fight and struggle with things in this world and the problems on our own, we only create more problems for ourselves. God tells us to stop and let Him take care of everything because He has already done that. There's no need for us to fight. There's no need for us to struggle on our own. There's only a need for us to look to Jesus. When Paul wrote his famous chapter on the armor of God, 
he told his readers to do one thing. It wasn't to run and retreat. It wasn't to fight on your own and disregard the Lord. It wasn't to hone our own abilities and our own intellect and our own mastery of the world's problems. Paul encouraged his readers to do one thing. He wrote, Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all, to stand firm. Paul tells us to stand firm in what God has already accomplished for us. Take the belt of truth. Take the breastplate of righteousness. Take the shoes of the gospel of peace. Take the helmet of salvation. Take the sword of spirit, which is God's word. God supplies and God has given us everything necessary to fight against the evil of the world. Why would we try to go and do anything different? God's simple command to us is to stop running. Stop running away from our sin, from our problems, from our difficulties. Stop running from who we are and what we don't want to confess about ourselves. And stand firm in His Word. <coughs> Look to Him for deliverance. Look to Him alone and see His salvation. God tells us this because He has done already everything that was needed. He has laid down His life on the cross for our sins. He has done it in the only acceptable way. He has taken that life back again to Himself through the resurrection. Now gives us the promise of our own resurrection. He has done all these things by His grace freely because He loves you and me and nothing more. Just as it is by grace, so also there is nothing left for us to do. God simply tells us to stand firm in His Word and to realize His salvation. What more can we ask for from God? What more do we need? God gives us a solution to every problem that we encounter, whether it be big or small. God simply says, Stand still and see my salvation. Amen. The peace of God which surpasses all of our understanding will keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.